I'd like to thank you for inviting me on the show. It's such an honour to be here, and I'd just like to say that when I'm not playing Xbox with my mate Thor, I really like to listen to my favourite podcast, Pop Culture Pasta. Hey Dave, I'm thinking about doing another revolution. Do you want to join up? I might need some help with organising the pamphlets, though. Pop Culture Pasta Cody, right off the bat here, I just need to tell you something. Okay. I need to tell you that I, I talked to Christopher Nolan back in the day about being the Joker <laughs> as well. Uh, did you know that about me? It's on par for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I bring it up now because um, I want you to know how awesome I am and I'm infringing on the memory of Heath Ledger. No big deal. Um, it, it was so weird. Yeah. Obviously, that was not me. That was Joaquin Phoenix after his movie about the Joker bombed. And then he decided he was going to like, I don't know what he was trying to say. Was he trying to say I was Nolan's first choice and, and I wasn't ready yet? Like, bro, don't go there. You weren't ready because Heath Ledger's the Joker. <laughs> and Heath definitely submitted that role as almost untouchable. Like, you're going to get compared to Heath no matter what. And some of the, I guess, Batman purists would say, Heath and Jack, don't forget Jack. Everyone else that has played the Joker within Batman live action gets compared to Heath. It was such an odd thing to say and slightly narcissistic. Yeah. But, um, but you know, listen. You, you can't touch Heath Ledger's in, interpretation of the Joker. We'll talk about Jared Leto. Um, you maybe maybe you surpassed Jared Leto, Joaquin. <laughs> if Joker would have just been a one-off, you might have been able to entertain the conversation of Joaquin being in the realm of Jack and Heath. But since there's another one out there, what? How incredibly sad is that? That y'all made a memorable movie. A good movie. Oh, yeah. And then you just totally blew it up with the second one. Just, it's bananas. Wow. That's, I mean, that's insane. Anyways. But my friend Quentin loved it. it Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> These aren't even news items. These no. aren't even news <laughs> items, but we'll bring it up. Yeah. Um, I should tell you, this is Pop Culture Pastor, the podcast. Uh, my name's Dave. Cody's here. Better known as Lead. And somehow, some way, Quentin Tarantino liked Joker too. Yeah. Well, if there was someone that was going to like it, I had it between Quentin and Marty. <laughs> but I thought it was too edgy for Marty. And so I went Quentin. <laughs> Quentin, Quentin said that Todd Phillips, the director of the Joker 2, wa was the Joker. Yes. Yeah, you call him whatever you want, but he ain't working in this town again. That's, that's what I'm told. <laughs> um, I am 99% certain that Steve Miller is the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a deep cut for our younger listeners. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So my name's Dave. I'm here. Led Tasso is also here. I am. As he's in full Halloween regalia as a member of the Richmond Greyhounds. With his visor and sunglasses. I'm like, he's in lead tasso. I've wanted I've wanted you to yell, get down and touch your feet fingers since you walked in the door. <laughs> I have nearly yelled about your feet fingers, but I'm trying to be somewhat more polite. We are recording this uh, uh, on Halloween, so. Yes. Yeah. Nothing left for us to do but to just get going. We've wasted enough time. Let's get to the news in, in what was kind of a fun little surprise yesterday, Marvel released um, their TV slate, their Disney Plus slate for the next year. Let, let me take a, just one second because we have not talked about this much. I just finished watching Agatha last night. I'm about to binge watch it. Agatha all along. I will not mention any spoilers because I, I imagine that some of you out there may be planning on watching it or wanting to watch it. I will tell you, it's not necessarily my cup of tea. I'm not interested usually in these characters that are that are in this show um, or 
this side of the Marvel universe, which is like kind of the magic, witchy, supernatural, supernatural side. There are some characters in that side of the Marvel universe I can dig into. Moon Knight is often Ghost Rider inc- included in that. Ghost Rider. There are some characters I'm I'm sort of into, but not Agatha. Agatha was usually a very side character with Scarlet Witch and the Vision. Anyways, it was a weird show. It's not necessarily made for everybody, but I'm here to tell you, Cody, I think Marvel figured something out because I can separate myself and my tastes from it and tell you it's it's done very, very well. Like, it's a really good story. I was interested, which for not being interested going into it, to become interested and to be still interested after it's done. Like, I want to know where these characters go now. That's saying something. I think Marvel figured something out. Unfortunately for my dear friends at Marvel, I could only pick one new show to follow uh, at a time, and I chose The Penguin, and it's been cleaning house. What what do you mean, cleaning house? With all the... Oh, this show's going to get nominated for every Emmy under yeah. the sun. I need to watch it, but the viewership numbers aren't great. They're not super. But there is there is people they it seems to have a a nucleus of hardcore fans, the penguin. So I um, want I would like to watch it. If you like the Sopranos, you'll love the penguin. Did you just compare the penguin to one of the greatest television shows of all time. You betcha. Okay, that's, I mean, we're getting a oh, little Oh, I'm saying crazy. it's in the <laughs> the genre and style. How hey, about that? Hey, <laughs> uh, All right. Um, so, yeah, anyways, back to Marvel. This from Variety. Marvel Studios officially unveiled its full slate of series on Disney Plus for 2025 in a new sizzle reel released on Wednesday. Did you watch the sizzle reel? Um... I don't have sizzle. (laughs) (laughs) We are just Just playing. We are just on fire today. We are. Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man starts things off on January 29th. Animated series will bring some new characters to the story of Peter Parker's first year as the web slinger, including Nico Minoru from the Runaways team. I don't know if you watched that show. I did not. Uh, And Amadeus Cho, who is a Hulk in the comics. Oh, nice. Marvel had previously announced that Daredevil Born Again will debut on March 4th, but the teaser finally provides the first robust look at the show, which will continue the events from the Daredevil series that ran on Netflix for three seasons from 2015 to 2018. Charlie Cox's Matt Murdock and Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin have already popped up a few times on Hawkeye and She-Hulk and Echo. Also returning John Bernthal as the Punisher, Wilson Bethel as Bullseye. And uh, there was a shot of the new villain, who's kind of scary, if I remember his comics lore right, uh, named Muse, oh. who's kind of the, not, Kingpin would be the overarching villain yes, in the background, but I guess the one in the forefront of this season is the Muse. So he's very interesting, very serial killer-y vibes. Creepy. Which is perfect for Daredevil. But I, I'm pretty excited. I'm even excited for the Spider-Man cartoon. Is it voiced by Tom? I don't believe so. I think at first they were going to. when they Back when they first announced it, I think maybe they were going to. But instead, they just got someone who sounds a lot like him. And is probably a lot cheaper. That makes sense. Yeah, it's like when you go to Walmart and you get a great value brand. I do every time. (laughs) It's like, you know, it's not the name brand, but it's a lot cheaper. And in most cases, it's about the same. It's comparable. I can live with it. Um, How how excited are you for Daredevil, though? I love the Netflix series. Yeah. And I think that comic book wise, the area that they are exploring potentially, I think should be very, very well for Disney. Yeah, I, I think at first, if I remember right, they did. I mean, it's named Born Again. Mm-hmm. And at first, I think they were planning on adapting some of that storyline. But I think it shifted as it often does with Marvel. And you're actually getting um, a part of a storyline. This doesn't really spoil anything because I think most people know this 
that are in the comics at all, where Kingpin becomes the mayor of New York. As Kingpin would. Which, you know, that's a that's a really cool angle to go at, uh, especially given Daredevil and Kingpin's history. So um, it's, it's good stuff. Which, by the way, if you didn't watch Echo, watch Echo. Again, a character you might not like be super enthralled with, but um, it makes you care about the characters and a little bit more background on Kingpin. Yeah. Well, and we may find out that that's where Marvel started turning the corner because I, I read an article where they were talking about they were talking about how good Agatha was mm-hmm. and that Marvel's focus on just telling the story of these characters, no matter how weird they are or whatever, but just making us care about the characters, which is the point of a story, right? It, that it maybe started with Echo. Unless you're Todd Phillips. <laughs> That's when the point of making your creation is to make the people mad who liked your first creation. Yeah. Which I don't know why you would do that, but okay. Um, and then on June 24th, Ironheart, which continues the story of the genius inventor Riri Williams, first introduced in 2022's Black Panther Wakanda Forever. It'll finally debut after it's gone through some production woes. Although, I will say, Cody, this show, I'm not, like, I don't really care or know much about the character. She was fine in the Black Panther movie. Um, I could have I could have <laughs> done without her. She, you could keep her in the movie. It doesn't really bother me. But I will say the hood is the villain of this show. And the hood is very much like brings in this technology versus magic vibe, mm-hmm. which kind of fits with where the Marvel Universe is heading. You've got Agatha. You've got the Scarlet Witch, who's all the rumblings are is that she's going to be a big part of Secret Wars. Um, um, she should be. Yeah. I know theoretically she's dead. I don't believe it. No, 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 no. They're they're bringing her back. Plus, you know, blades on the back burner, but you know, will surely eventually get made. I would think. They're talking about a Moon Knight season two. They're they're delving into that supernatural world in the Marvel on Marvel and Anthony Ramos as Parker Robbins, who is the Hood, is the perfect. Really, the perfect villain. That's what has me interested in this show because, like I said, I don't really have any investment in Ironheart, but the hood's a cool character because he starts off as like this low level criminal thief, basically who has a little bit of technology, but then somehow finds himself face to face with Mephisto as one does. And, uh, you know, at the crossroads as the old yarn goes and makes a deal Mm. and becomes more of a supernatural type threat. And then, um, the villain looks really good and in the in the sizzle reel he actually you hear a quote of his he says anyone who's ever accomplished anything iconic in life has had to do some questionable things to get it done and i thought okay i'm in on the strength of the villain alone the hood i'm in i think with disney shifting from everything has to be for the kids to we might get a little HBO-esque with the villains, at least. I will say that I think the Agatha all along owes a lot of its vibe and its direction to the one-shot Werewolf by Night. The vibes are kind of the same. And it's that thing. Yeah, it's exactly what I was. What you're saying is they they left behind, let's do what we think the fans want instead and in lieu of Hey, we're going to make a show. We're going to go all in on like kind of what this character and then like the vibes around that character. And then some people like it and some might not. And and that's OK. I'm here for it. August 6th, we'll see the debut of Eyes of Wakanda, another animated series. I do like that they're with the success of X-Men 97. They should they should make more animated stuff. It's easy to make. Easy to make, and also I think it helps bring up another generation of superhero fans. Yeah. Eyes of Wakanda details the efforts of the Wakandan war dogs throughout the nation's history to recover vibranium artifacts. Four-episode series, only four, 
but premieres on August 6th. Marvel Zombies, in which many of the studio's most beloved superheroes, including Captain America, Scarlet Witch, Captain Marvel, Hawkeye, become part of an army of the undead. That's set to de- debut next October, a year from now. I have um, a comic book of the the Marvel Zombies. Yeah, Marvel Zombies are popular, and if they do that right, that could be very good. And it'll be uh, Marvel's first rated um, TV mature animated show. Eek! Yeah, yeah. So presumably a lot of blood and guts. But good. And brains. Yeah. <laughs> good. Make it. Make it right. Um, the, I thought the most intriguing thing about the scissor reel was Wonder Man starring uh, Emmy winner Yaha Abdul Mateen II, who's been in the TV show Watchmen and in Aquaman. He is playing the titular character of Simon Williams. Are you aware of Wonder Man, Cody? I'm aware of Wonder Bread and Wonder Woman. That's all the wonders I need. Okay. In besides the, the band, the wonders. In the comics, he's like the Vision's brother. He's mm. he's not entirely real <laughs> as, as far as humanity goes, um, I believe. At least that's how he started, maybe. In the comics, he's also like an actor who has um, a, a business empire, I guess. He'd be like kind of like Ryan Reynolds today. Who's got, go. who's got all the side ventures all, uh, along with being an actor. But what was interesting is in the sizzle reel, and this made my, I mean, my eyebrows went straight up. He's clearly trying to audition for the part of Simon Williams, wonder man, which I thought was interesting. I thought, Oh, this is going to have a different spin on it. I think than than what we're used to in the comics. And frankly, again, do some if you're going to go out on a limb, focus on the storytelling and tell us an interesting, unique story. And then, you know, some people might not like it. I am way more willing to step away from the IP if it's not in the name of politics or wokeness or whatever you want to call it. You know, what I'm saying like Agatha all along has a lot of LGBT stuff and I'm not offended by it because it's not about that. It's about the characters, which, okay, fine. That's mm. great. Just do that. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not so, I'm not so caught up in it all. Yeah. I, I'm here for, if you can do something creative, that makes sense for, mm. um, the story that you're telling. And like, with Batman, you can't get away from Thomas and Martha being killed every time. You got to show that. Uh, but characters that aren't that top tier uh, for Marvel or D- or for DC, um, yeah, you can play with them. Yeah. Yeah, but Wonder like, Man. Wonder Man is definitely that. No one here has a Wonder Man tattoo. <laughs> they're they're not going to be like, oh, you changed the background. Someone somewhere has a Wonder Man tattoo. Guaranteed. Please yeah. don't. <laughs> if you have a Wonder Man tattoo, please reach out to us on our social media pages. Uh, Pop Culture Pastor. We're on Facebook, X, Instagram. Just do it. We need to see a picture of that Wonder Man tattoo because I know someone out there has one. Uh, you want to talk about James Gunn? Jimmy Just Gunn? And, and you DC? betcha. Uh, James Gunn, some, so apparently uh, a list of McFarlane toys and DC direct action figures and play sets for the upcoming Superman movie came out. Oh. And uh, it got, re- you know, someone found the list and released it. And But James Gunn wasn't tripping. He said, eh, it doesn't ruin anything in the movie. And he's right. It really doesn't. I think everyone, all the figures, I think we already knew were in the movie. Would you, would you like to refresh your yourself? Yes. So there's a Superman with crypto. Yeah, the dog. Lex Luthor with baby kaiju, which what? <laughs> there's a there's a kaiju in the movie? <laughs> That's a spoiler. <laughs> uh Ultraman, Metamorpho, Green Lantern Guy Gardner, Mr. Terrific. Who's Ultraman again? I know I know who Metamorpho is. Um yeah, you're asking me. Oh, oh, Ultraman. Okay, he's like the he's like a strong guy, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Anyways, 
Yeah, those are the toys. Oh, no, I couldn't find any pictures of the toys, which was a bummer. It was just the list because I really wanted to see some of the character design. Cody, Amazon MGM Studios is planning on ramping back up with the Jack Ryan stuff. Were, were you a fan of the Jack Ryan series on Amazon? Never watched it. Oh, you should, man. John Krasinski was great. They had role. a thousand Jack shows. I but, finally got to, to reach her. <laughs> right, I know, but you should just watch the John Krasinski ones. Because it's like he's a young Jack Ryan, obviously, than what was, you know, shown in the movies. Um, but they're they're developing a movie after so there's four seasons of it, and now they're developing a movie for Krasinski to play Jack Ryan. And I'm kind of excited because I think now would be the perfect time to maybe redo it's, I think it's been long enough to maybe try and redo Hunt for the Red October or some of the clear and present danger. Some of the more like really, really iconic Jack Ryan stories that were done by Harrison Ford in some of them. And then um, Alec Baldwin, I think, was Jack Ryan in Hunt for the Red October. Have you watched Hunt for the Red October? It's been many moons. Yeah, it's good. And Jack Ryan is, I mean, I wouldn't say he's the star star, but you could always make base it around him and rewrite it yeah in such a way where he was kind of the focus he was seeing it through the, you're seeing it through his lens but it's good it's good i i just think now's the time give me really what i really like is john krasinski um jim <laughs> finally cody we're all going to be able to get dysentery together soon maybe cholera typhoid measles the f fever Basically, scurvy. We're all we're all going to be able to 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 kill some buffalo and find out we can't carry all the meat. Oh, yeah, and if you uh, have figured out by now that what I'm talking about is the old PC game, the Oregon Trail, um, you should know that it at Apple Original Films they're developing a movie based on the old PC game. <laughs> I have no idea how they're going to do this. It's going to end quickly with me dying of dysentery. <laughs> uh, the Lucas brothers, are, who are the writers, are most well known for writing the Academy Award nominated script for Judas and the Black Messiah. Still need to watch that. Look really good. La La Land songwriters Benj Pasek and Justin Paul are producing the movie through their ampersand production banner, and Will Speck and Josh Gordon are slated to direct and have producing credits. Josh Gordon, formerly of the Cleveland Browns no, and Kansas City Chiefs? Not that Josh Gordon. This is the filmmaking duo who generally has worked on comedy films such as Blades of Glory and The Switch. That makes more sense. Yeah. So uh, I guess it's going to be a comedy. I think there's always, uh, there's a chance, like, you, listen, it has to be original. You can't make a straight up adaption of this kind of a game. So if they went, I, I don't know, what's the standard? What's the standard of how you make this movie? Is it the Barbie movie where you take some broad a uh, toy or game, you know, something like that, that you'd think, well, how do you make that into a movie? And then you really insert some like intelligent humor into it along with something to say and put it, wrap it in a story. I mean, is that how you do this? I would think so. Otherwise, if you wanted it to still feel like a game, um, you could do what, um, uh was it uh, Black Mirror did hmm. where you get to select like what choice the character makes and then oh. it could lead to one of like 15 different endings. Do people like that though? I don't remember. I remember hearing about that gimmick. I don't remember a lot of people watching it. So I did watch it. I did not overly care for it, but at the same time, I would go down the rabbit hole again. Yeah. Yeah. I hated choose your own adventures because if I did a choose your own adventure on the Oregon Trail, I would always end up dying of dysentery like before I could cross the Kansas River, yeah, which we seems impossible. <laughs> didn't even get to 
tried to block the river. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's all I have for the news. When we come back, we're going to review Venom 3, The Last Dance. Stick around. Stay tuned. Uh, and heads up because you're about to hear our spoiler warning. Greetings, Dave's Blurb Voice here. In a world where we do movie reviews on a podcast, you need to be aware that we are going to spoil the nerd out of this movie. We know that spoilers aren't everyone's cup of tea, so if that's you, go ahead and hit pause, see the movie, and then come back and listen to this thrilling podcast later. The Pop Culture Podcast Movie Review starts now. Okay, Cody, uh, everybody out there, you just heard the spoiler warning. You should know, we'll say it again, if you haven't seen Venom 3, The Last Dance, and you don't want to be spoiled, then you probably should turn this off, go watch the movie, and then come back and listen to us talk about it. You probably should also watch Venom 1 and 2. You can, but it's not necessary. <laughs> I think I proved that. Um, I did watch. I've seen most of Venom One, most uh, mostly. It does help because you do get more of a character development of Eddie and Venom. Yeah, maybe. Although this movie has problems, that's not one of them. Yeah, yeah. But you get to see the start. Yeah, and then. You get to go on the journey with them. Right, right. And I imagine that would be. I assume that's what, not having watched all the movies, I would assume that's what people enjoy about this, is Venom and Eddie. Oh, yeah. It's definitely Tom Hardy is carrying the full weight of all three movies. Did you know he does the voice of Venom? Yes. I did not know that. I, I had to Google it and look it up when, when I was working on my notes here for this movie. And I thought, well, cause I was like, who is the voice of venom? And then I saw that it was Tom Hardy. And I'm like, this dude wasn't getting paid enough. Pay the man. Um, like Woody Harrelson did good in carnage. Oh, don't it, give me that. It just wasn't, <laughs> I could do without carnage. Honestly. Yeah, on, yeah. What I'm saying is this dude basically made this film series happen on the back of his own talent mm -hmm. because this should not have been a winner. And yet it was for Sony. This whole series of movies, it was probably a winner. I mean, it made $51 million in its opening weekend, which is pretty okay. I think they were projecting 35 to $40 million. It kept going down and down and down, and then it made $51 million. I'm like, all right, that's not terrible. Um, because of Venom, they thought it was Morbin time. <laughs> <laughs> or... That her web could connect us all. It's literally Tom Hardy that is giving us the Sony verse. Yeah, real honestly, Tom Hardy makes it happen. Uh, side note: We saw a trailer for Craven uh, before this movie because Cody and I went and saw Venom three together. Yes. Oh dear Lord, Cody. Oh dear, what are they doing? Um, I will say that might be the best rhino on screen but it's totally not comic accurate i don't know why i said that like i was from the east coast but <laughs> <laughs> he's a guy in a suit he's not a mutant like half man half rhino guy i like to think he got fused with the rhino no that's not the way it happened uh, that movie looks terrible but we're totally getting a sinister six but like this in the vein of the suicide squad from sony aren't we where they're all going to be good guys that's what that's what we're getting, right? Good guys adjacent. Oh my goodness. We're gonna get Madam Webb, Morbius, Craven, uh who else? Who are other quote they'll they'll try and get Tom Hardy back for it, Venom, and we'll get the Sinister Six, but you know, sucky. <laughs> And, and, and no Spider-Man to be found, even though the whole point of that team in the comics is to kill Spider-Man. Um, maybe they can get Bad Bunny back and finally make that wrestling luchador <laughs> Spider-Man villain. Oh, man. Yeah, that looks, the Craven looks bad. Anyways, we're talking about Venom 3, The Last Dance. 
directed by Kelly Marcel, $120 million budget. That's not terrible. No. Not these days. 39% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Do you want to hear the blurb? What's the fan score? The fan score? Was that the critic score or the fan score? On Rotten Tomatoes? I don't know. Let me let me hold on. Let me look. The fan score is eighty percent. I was going to say that number sounds wrong. Uh, the fans are. I don't know. They got to stop with the drug use. Well, that's a little bloated. <laughs> so I, I didn't realize until Venom One came out, like how big of like a following Venom has outside. It, within like comic book fans, how many people like Venom? Yeah, mm-hmm. cool dude. Yeah, uh, okay, cool symbiote. There's like a cult following. Like, there's a cult following of people that love the Predator. Th- those movies. Oh, what does that have to do with Venom? Uh, I'm saying like y- you just run across these people out in the yeah. wild, and like they are diehards about it, and. If it's somewhat good, they're going to say it was great. Yeah, that's true. Some The people that would like anything, any story you want to tell with that IP. I see what you're saying. We should have a show where we have like the most tortured fans. Because if you're an, if you're an alien or predator fan, boy, have you just been hosed over the years. <laughs> Aside from like the very original movies, you get going through the catalogs of those two characters alone. Uh, Prey was good. But well, right. Recently, they yeah. made a good Predator movie. So, but every there was a lot of garbage. Oh yeah. And this is like, look, if you're uh, having been a comic book nerd, Venom is a very cool character, and he is a beloved character. But if this is all you ever get from it, this series of films, woof, <laughs> a- absolute woof. Like, come on. All right, here's the blurb. <clears throat> Eddie Brock and Venom must make a devastating decision as they're pursued by a mysterious military man and alien monsters from Venom's homeworld. That's it. That's the blurb. I love it. <laughs> you don't want to spoil anything. And yeah. I'm here for it. Better, better to leave this amazingly dense and complex plot <laughs> to mystery. <laughs> Uh, stars Tom Hardy as Eddie in the voice of Venom, Juno Temple, uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Reese Ifans, Stephen Graham, and Andy Serkis as the voice of Noel. That, that's a pretty solid list of talent. And Peggy Lou. <laughs> right, yes. Because Mrs. Chin is beloved. Mrs. Chin is beloved. I'm not so sure about the scene in this movie that she was back for, but we'll get there. Cody, I have a question. This was rated PG-13. Is Venom a weird character to do in PG-13 style? I feel like maybe he should have had the Deadpool treatment. So according to my friend Tomas Hardy, he said he would be back as Venom for a Logan style rated R movie. Yeah, it just seems to make more sense with the character. Where I assume it would also be a send-off forever. Like, you don't go back unless you're Disney and then you ruin it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm still upset about Wolverine's Hugh Jackman coming back. Anyway, I, I do think that Venom, for it being, if you make it PG-13, this is the way it's going to look. Yeah. And this is probably the best you can do with it. Yeah. And yeah. I will I will say that. Let me let me piggyback on that with just one thought. I think they made the right choice with Deadpool, did Marvel Studios. Because I think this series is what you would have got by making Deadpool PG thirteen. It would have looked a lot like this Venom series. It would have. I think that it's okay. It, yeah. it, it would definitely benefit from going rated R, but then you probably lose some people that won't ever see it because that next level rating. But you would also, I think, gain repeat viewers and probably new viewers that are like, oh, this is just as good as Deadpool. Yeah. 
I just feel like this story with the symbiotes, like let's let's be honest, um, the monsters in Thor: Love and Thunder, which are supposed to be, they're the same. So the the I don't know what they're called, xenophages. I think. Yes. Uh, these monsters that are the minions of Knoll, um, that's the monsters that are supposed to be in Thor Love and Thunder, but because they don't have the rights, blah, 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 they never call them that. And you only get to see them in the shadows. And, and that movie was ridiculous in all of its uh, Taika waititi but even in that, they seemed more frightening in that movie than they did in this movie, which I think is unforgivable. Like these, Knoll and those characters should be scary. Slash... Disney and Sony need to figure out, like, can we get Noel his sword? Yeah, if you were going to use that character, that that takes me back to Thor Love and Thunder, which would have been like, if you would have utilized that character right, you could have introduced Noel way back in that, in that movie with a name drop. Yes. Just that that's where the all, all, the all black came, because they did introduce the sword. Mm -hmm. That's what the sword was that Gore had in Thor Love and Thunder. And they couldn't even tie that together for people, which is unfortunate. Um, so yeah, let's just let's just take a broad look at the story here. It picks up after the end credit scene from Spider-Man No Way Home, where Eddie is in the Mexican bar. Uh, and then they immediately cancel out wherever you thought they were going back then, <laughs> within the first two minutes with some corny line about, I, I hate multiverses or something like that. <laughs> I laughed so hard at that. <laughs> it was funny, but gosh, it just really speaks to the ineptness of the last few years of the changing stories and how it affects both studios, frankly. Well, this was the only way that you could you do the multiverse thing and you get Eddie and Venom into Marvel area yeah. yeah and then now we gotta go back to his timeline yeah. to to finish the story i get why they had to do it it just feels weird we're introduced to noel the king of the symbiotes who at some point some point was imprisoned by the symbiotes now he's the king of jack and nothing apparently and jack just left town <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a, a big trouble a little china line it is seriously Seriously, though, you want the audience to believe that he's real bad news, but we only see him as a captive. Cody, why can't Marvel figure out how to villain? I don't know. He literally spends the entire movie as a captive. Well, if you saw Venom 2 and you saw how brutal the rest of the symbiotes are. Oh, we'll get to the symbiotes, Cody. Um, well... With <laughs> when there's the carnage venom battle, if you yeah. will, and whose side you're on, you're going to you you find out like, oh, these dudes are bad mamma jammas. Maybe if they all team up. Yeah. In a plot point straight out of Lord of the Rings, the things Noel has sent to hunt down Venom slash Eddie can only be can only see Venom slash Eddie when they go the full Venom. Yep. Like literally it's seriously like Frodo putting on the ring. Now, this has to do with something that he's created when the symbiotic brings back, the symbiote brings back its host from the dead. And honestly, none of that really made sense to me. So basically, you can just say whenever Eddie Frodo puts on the ring, the monsters can see him. I'm sorry, Eddie Venom. <laughs> just to prove to you that Sony does not have an original thought. They literally steal the name of their MacGuffin from the MacGuffin in the Man of Steel movie and call it the Codex. I literally laughed out loud when they referred to it as the Codex. I just like to think they knew something good when they saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, this was, this is something, the kind of thing that bothers me, Cody, because I'm like, Listen, if you already have several derivative things in your movie, how hard is it to just come up with it a name for it? Why couldn't they just come up with a name? You could make up any word you wanted. Why call it the Codex? Maybe it's called the Codex in the comics. We need Scotty on for that. That's a question for Scotty. That is. I'm sure I will get a message from Scotty <laughs> after this drops. Scotty, by the way, who's been on the show 
every time we do a pod related to comic books, we get like play by plays as he's listening to the pod over messages, Facebook messenger. I love it. Yeah. It's awesome. He like, he like re he's reacting in real time as he's listening and we get the messages usually during our work day. <laughs> Cause I'm, my phone keeps going off and it's like, Oh, it's Scotty. And he's telling us we were wrong about this comic book story plot point. Yes. And I believe him because Scotty knows more about comics than I do. Anyways, Cody, it turns out there's a secret government installation beneath Area 51 because Area 51 just ain't secret enough. Well, of course it's not. They have other symbiotes, symbiotes, symbiotes. I'll probably say that five different ways. They have other symbiotes they've captured and they're on the hunt for Eddie slash Venom. There's a lot of foreboding about how big and bad Noel is, but all this is weirdly interspersed with vignettes of Venom dancing with Mrs. Chen. Yeah. <laughs> and hitching a ride with the most overtly exaggerated hippies since Forrest Gump. Which I'm here for. It was so weird, though. That's how I view hippies. It's like they went into my brain and were like, Cody, how do you think about hippies that want to see aliens? It's, Boom. It's so exaggerated, even down to the names of the kids. <laughs> like they were moon and I can't even remember what their names were. It was crazy. It all ends. It all culminates in a big, bad final action sequence between the symbiotes, uh, Knowles hunters, the American military, and somehow some way that hippie family Eddie caught a ride with, but it all ends in a pleasing marvelous sort of way with the good guys winning sacrifice and a and new possible characters to move on with. Until the mid credit scene absolutely rips it away to give Noel the Thanos I'll do it myself treatment. Weirdest mid credit scene ever. It's already been announced that they're doing a Noel like going forward with Noel in a Noel movie. Yeah. So I'm hoping they explain how he gets out. Yeah, I hope so, too, because they sure didn't do it in the movie. And yet that mid credit scene happened. It did. Uh, so, Cody, let's just get to what's good. What did you think was good about this movie? Tom Hardy. Mm. I I will say Tom Hardy twice because he, he does voice uh, Venom as well. But him as Eddie, him as Venom, the dynamic between the two, such love-hate back-and-forth banter. And when things get real and it's all about to hit the fan, you get some raw moments. And it would not have worked without Tom Hardy. I literally think this whole franchise, the reason it did not go the way of Morbius, is because of Tom Hardy. Yeah, he's the first thing I have listed in my notes. Because Tom Hardy, first of all, I did these notes before I figured out he was also the voice of Venom. So I said Tom Hardy and CGI symbiote chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally put in my notes, can you have chemistry with CGI? Well, you can if it's you. Yeah, you can. I, then when I found that, I'm like, oh, this dude's brilliant. That's actually brilliant. Anytime Tom Hardy and Venom on a, are on screen, especially by themselves, it's very good. And then when there's other people on screen with them and they're bantering, in the middle of whatever's happening, be it with Mexican gang members or hippie families, whatever, it's very funny. Mixed in if you're if you can catch it, because sometimes it's just a dropped line here and there. Um, easily the best parts of this movie are Tom Hardy and Eddie Brock and Venom. What yeah. else? I will go with Cristo Fernandez, better known as Bartender. <laughs> or Danny from Ted Lasso. Danny Rojas. Football is life. And sometimes the insurance salesman now. Yes. As he's now been uh, as Danny Rojas in the commercials with Patrick Mahomes and uh, the State Farm guy. That's who <laughs> the State Farm guy is. He's not asked to do a lot in this movie, but what he does definitely helps. Is it, he's, It's weird because he's barely in it. He's barely in any of this, and yet he's somehow, some way, the linchpin yes. of this entire story. <laughs> As he's the guy whose presence makes you realize, like, oh, okay, we know where he's at. We know where he is. And also, it shows you, like, how much darker the Sony timeline is. Yeah. 
Because he's depressed, Danny Rojas. He looks very sad. Yes. In this universe. It made me sad for him. I'm like, oh, the Marvel universe is just a brighter, happier place. It is. Anything else on your what's good? Um, I will say I think that this movie had a ton of comedic moments that worked out very well. It did. I'd agree with that. Um, and as they're, they're traveling, especially with the hippies, some of that was just really laugh out loud hilarious and i really love when they're singing david bowie <laughs> in the <laughs> car uh that was great and i will say there's a couple of like real heartfelt moments in it um especially at the very end when it's clear that venom and eddie aren't going to make it out together yeah yeah it was really funny there's some really, really funny moments in this movie that I wasn't ready for. Um, I have here in my notes the first action sequence with Eddie slash Venom and the Mexican gang. That whole scene is great. Oh, yeah. Like, it's first of all, the action's good. They, like, ramp up the menace of Venom well in that. And then the hilarity, which was actually in the trailers. So yeah. I knew it was coming, but it was still funny of him, tr them trying to get the catchphrase, right? <laughs> Cause uh, even after seeing this movie and knowing it from the scene that for the previews, I still went home that night with I'm Venom. <laughs> like, I just love the way that it riffs in that scene. And yes. plus the action is really, really good. I do have that action sequence and the final action set piece at area 51. I thought was all, also pretty good which and they inserted a lot of heart into that which again man just give tom hardy all the credit in the world because there's no reason your heartstrings should be tugged at this movie no reason but whatsoever. they are <laughs> but they kind of are at the end and you're like wow they did that pretty well i will also say andy circus as noel i'm here for like we didn't get much Noel, but no, no. the the voice sounded cool. We'll see how the graphics look when we get full Noel. Yeah, he didn't look good in this movie, but I assume that he got tacked onto the end of it pretty pretty late in production, potentially, because he did not even need to be in this movie, and his presence in the movie is confusing, as we've already talked about. It's just a launching point. Yeah. Which, well, anyways, Marvel's not even that great at that. And Sony, uh, well, all right. Let's talk about what's not so good, Cody. What's not? Oh, boy. How much time do we got? <laughs> what's not so good? Um, I don't want to attack this person. Oh, um, oh, we're going after individuals. I, I won't. I'll go after the character of Dr. Teddy Payne. Oh, man. Um, Poor Juno Temple. It, you either need to get rid of a bunch of other things in this movie and flush out that character a lot for me to like even care remotely. The the thing with her brother dying, I guess, is important, but at the same time, it really wasn't. Like if you're gonna make, if you're gonna give us those plot points about her character, the movie probably needs to be more from her point of view rather than her just being this kind of side character, because none of that really lands when, when you're not coming from her point of view. Now, if they made this movie completely from her point of view and Eddie Venom was just a character in it, then I guess that makes a little more sense. So her symbiote, because she gets fused with one, is Agony, and it gets some new flash-like speed thrown with it. And since she's been struck by lightning and has the markings, I mean, I guess that's good connection, but it was kind of weak. At times, you wonder whether the symbiotes are comic, are actual characters, or if they were just generic. Because you don't get them named. You yeah. get the colors and you get the powers, and then you're left to infer, like, Oh, this one's this one. Yeah, I have since, after some research, found out that they are from the comics. Almost all of them. Mm -hmm. They just don't really let the viewer in on that. Which, whatever, it doesn't. That doesn't bother me. But they are. They are literally the things they do in the movie. 
They are a certain group of symbiotes. They had a name. I just don't remember it. What else? What else is not so good? The scene with Mrs. Chin was funny, but it really made no sense. No. Because, like, Venom had already said, we can't go full Venom (laughs) or it will be able to find us. And then he goes full Venom and nearly gets Mrs. Chin killed. I mean... If you're the lethal protector, if you're if, if if that's the thing you're going with, and you make yourself visible visible to murderous monsters, so you can do ballroom dancing with Mrs. Chen in the penthouse of the Vegas Hilton, that seems weird. To dancing queen, <laughs> <laughs> like it was just such an odd thing. Like you literally just endangered everyone in that hotel. Vegas is pretty densely populated, my man. I was okay with endangering everyone, except for Mrs. Chin. The most interesting thing about that scene is, wow, Venom really likes Mrs. Chin. We should dig into that story a little bit. (laughs) Well, Mrs. Chin really loves Venom. I know. That's interesting. Well, it gets flushed out over the previous two (laughs) movies because Venom eats all the bad guys that try to rob Mrs. Chin's uh, convenience store. And... Also, Venom is a lot nicer than Eddie <laughs> yeah. towards Mrs. Chin. So. Yeah, uh, this story's a mess, dude. That's it, the first thing on my list of what's not so good from the opening doing away with the direction the last movie had within the first two minutes. Uh, it's a pointless dance sequences that if I'm being honest, I sort of enjoyed. I loved it. <laughs> I mean, it's not good for the story, but... It was enjoyable, if I'm being honest. Um, let's talk about Chiwetel Ejiofor, though. Wonderful actor. His character is such a cardboard cookie cutter of a character. I'm honestly befuddled why you would pay an actor of his caliber to play it. It's absolutely impossible for him to bring any flavor to that role as poorly written as it was as he's basically the general from Man of Steel, Independence Day, and about a hundred other movies needing a quote-unquote general that you're not sure you like, then you definitely don't like, then you kind of like a little. It's such a trope, his character. I just can't believe they paid him to do this. Oh, I can. You need some big names when you're doing this type of movie. Also... But is he a big name? Uh, Like he's he's, uh, definitely a familiar face. Don't let's put it it that way. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Amazingly great actor, but he's not like a box office draw. Yeah. So I do think this character would have lost any ounce of non cardboardishness with most other actors. He does get a little zeal to it, especially in the scene where he's like, you're out of here. I'm taking over this joint in death to all you jabronis. Yes. He didn't say those words. The, ge- the general in the other movies I mentioned never does that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like, look, look, I love him as an actor. Yes. And I'm not putting this on him at all. It's not his fault. But the, the, the characters, his character, Juno Temple's character, I mean, they're paper thin. They just needed to be there to for you to know, ah, oh, this is where all these other symbiotes have been this whole time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. They got captured by the government. And you also need some warm bodies for them to go to when the big battle goes down. Yes. Yeah. Um, and other things that are not so good, and I can hear Scotty already rebutting this. But I know the comics, and I know the comics left this behind a long time ago. I'm just still a little annoyed that the symbiotes, uh, who in the comics started off as no conscience killing machines, yeah, in this movie are essentially refugees with hearts of gold. <laughs> like, all right, I mean, uh, so during Venom Carnage or Venom 2, whatever. You do see that there's some that are more like Carnage that we got to kill and take over everything. And then there's some that are more like Venom. In in the 90s, evidently, as they're introducing Noel or getting 
more background to Noel's character, you realize why Venom had to flee his area of the universe because there's something bigger and badder out there. So there is this component that is there. And I think the three movies, you get Eddie and Venom kind of battling out like, when is it okay to kill? When is it not okay to kill? Because at first Venom's like, death to everything and eddie's like no we only kill bad people yeah well i can tell you where this went wrong and it's long before these movies and we've already mentioned the name of it in the mid 90s a comic comes out with a red foil embossed cover called venom lethal protector and it's dog manure (laughs) it's this is where it all went bad where vent this is kind of that was the turn where they make they made venom more of an anti-hero just not down with it just not down with it. Venom was one of, to that point, the Todd McFarlane creation of Venom in the Spider-Man comics was one of the most interesting, cool villains existing in the Marvel Universe at the time. And I know a lot of people still love him, but that's where it all went wrong. Lethal Protector. I had that comic. Boy, it was overproduced and not worth anything, as as a lot of those foil embossed special covers were. <laughs> Looked cool, though. In fact, I'm not sure how to do it. But I'm going to just go ahead and say that Marvel's bankruptcy, I'm going to blame it all on Venom Lethal Protector. They printed too many issues of it. Nobody bought it and they went bankrupt. And then they had to sell their characters. They didn't get them back until recently and still don't have Spider-Man back. Or Venom. Is there anything else you want to put on the what's not so good side? No, I'm good with that. All right, let's go to deeper themes. Do you have a deeper theme, Cody? Or would you like me to go first? I'll let you go first. Okay. I'm still kind of formulating the words. I think there's a good theme in these movies of making things work with the people you have to do life with. For most of us in life, that usually means family or coworkers, things like that. The the people we don't get to choose, but that we want to make it work with, or we need to make it work with here in this movie, Eddie in particular doesn't choose venom, but has it thrust upon him. But this movie, I think, does a decent job of highlighting their connection. And by the time you get to the heartfelt scene at the end, it's mildly affecting. Like, it's an affecting scene. And when you understand that they're thrust into each other's lives, that translates nicely to, you know, it's election season. You might have a family member you vehemently disagree with, but don't cut them out. Mm -hmm. Like, it's better to go through life with people you you disagree with and being able to still care about them. Like it's just better. It makes everything better. And I thought this movie has a good solid through line with the other movies. And it ends with this scene. That's really kind of affecting of like Eddie wanted, Eddie didn't ask for this. Venom didn't ask for this, (laughs) but here we are. And you got to make do with the people that you got to make do with. I will piggyback on that and highlight the the fact that like throughout all three movies, Eddie is okay if Venom was to go the way of the dodo bird at times. And at the very end when Eddie's in the hospital bed and he's trying to talk to the big guy, he's not there and he is saddened by it. And so, yeah. Cherish the time you have with your friends, your family, your loved ones. Um, because it's not always guaranteed that there will be a tomorrow. And yeah, yeah, that scene really works when he's laying on the hospital bed and he's like, buddy, hey, buddy. And yeah. there's no answer. And you're like, oh, man, this is actually tugging my heartstrings a little bit. And uh, I did like that he got to go to the Statue of Liberty and yeah. remember his friend. Yeah. Time for a new segment. On our movie reviews, we're, I'm calling it casting do over because I just don't have a catchy name for it yet. Yeah. So if you think if you have a fun name for basically the point of this is we're going to pick we get one pick, one pick to recast in the movie we're reviewing. And the catch is, is it has to make the movie better. That's our argument is that we recast one position, one actor or actress, and we say this makes the movie better. Cody, would you like to go first, or would you like me to go first? I will go first. Go for it. This is a character I have already talked about before, and 
I feel bad, especially wearing my Ted Lasso gear. Mm, um, we're going the same direction. Dr. Teddy Payne. Yeah. Um, I'm recasting. I like Juno. Juno just might not have been the best choice for this role and or the role just wasn't written that well. But I will go. I think you need to go at least looking older. And this person is older. And I think has some gravitas that you would think, oh, this person's a real serious scientist. Mm. Um, I'm interested to see who you're putting in this role. Nicole Kidman. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Interesting choice. I'm yeah. going Nicole. Yeah. I'm going to go the same direction. Like you said, I like Juno Temple. I feel like Juno Temple is completely wasted in this movie, much like she would tell Edgy of four. In fact, I went back and forth with who I was going to recast here. Because for a while, I thought maybe you recast the general, but uh, cast a comedic actor and just go a completely different direction with it. So he's not like a total trope. But I went with Teddy Payne, Dr. Teddy Payne, played by Juno Temple. I think she's completely wasted in this movie. She, like you said, she never really seems right for the part they wrote. Mm -hmm. It was like the studio said, well, she's up and coming. Everyone knows her from Ted Lasso. She just got nominated for an Emmy, Emmy for Fargo, which she's fantastic in. Let's overrule the casting director and put her in this role. I feel like that's what happened. And I feel like that's what happened maybe in a lot of cases in this movie for these side parts. Like maybe the studio just didn't give it, give the casting director a choice and said, we're putting them in the movie. Uh, the problem with this is she's never really believable as someone who works for this extremely top secret project for the government. Government, We're never really privy to what it is exactly that makes her an expert Yep. in this project. Through no fault of her own, her character is super paper thin. So I would have gone with someone, assuming I'm getting the same writing in the same movie, I would have put someone older, a bit older, to at least make her more believable as a scientist who's put in her time and paid her dues and eventually landed in this project. Yes. So I'm casting Maggie Gyllenhaal as the character. And I'm not sure that she's all that much older, although I'm pretty sure she is. I just think that she carries like the more of the, the kind of look and the gravitas, as you said, of someone who's been around. And Juno Temple, she just has, Juno has this like really innocent vibe, even though she plays like a really saucy character in Ted Lasso. Mm -hmm. She she does this well with this this innocence. Fargo's the same way. In Fargo, man, she's super crafty and resourceful and a killer. Like you gotta, like she's the heroine of the series, but she's also deadly and yet portrays this innocence so well. She's really good at it. And she's just wasted in this role. I just, ah, so weird. So I'm going with Maggie Gyllenhaal. I feel bad for Juno in this regard that she's kind of paper thin throwaway characters in two big comic book franchises. Cause she was in the dark Knight rises. She was one of the Catwoman's friends that, um, Oh man, she's, she gets helped out quite a bit by Catwoman. I forgot about that. Um, and Anne Hathaway's Catwoman, which yeah, her, I tried to forget about that, but um, <laughs> she was fine. She was okay. She wasn't the best Catwoman. Um, and then she's in Venom, The Last Dance, and I'm like, ah, oh, you're in these big movies and these big franchises, but. You are kind of an afterthought, I feel, in both. Uh, if you want to see her at her best, go watch the most recent season of Fargo, which I believe is on FX, which I think you can watch on Hulu. Amazing. So good. And each each season of Fargo stands on its own, so you don't have to have watched the other seasons. Just watch the most recent season of Fargo. She's great. And obviously, she got nominated for an Emmy. And she deserved it. Really, really good. Cody, who's the winner of the movie? I wanted to say Mrs. Chin, but <laughs> it will be Thomas Hardy. Yeah, it's got to be Tom Hardy, right? Um, it was nearly the guy from House of the Dragon, the hippie guy, but... <laughs> Reese Evans? Yes. Reese Evans? But no, man. He was so endearing. And then all of a sudden he saw the aliens that he had been wanting to see. And he's like, nope. I love that Reese Evans is this like really respected actor 
who's like if you if you've been watching House of the Dragon, he's great in it. But yes. plays a very rugged, dramatic character in it. But then also, if you need a hippie, he's call, your guy. Call Reese the fans because I feel like he's played this hippie in multiple movies. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Tom Hardy's your winner. Yes. Yeah. For for basically things we've already talked about. Carrying three movies single-handedly. He's the winner of the movie for me, too. I think it's a good send-off for the character. He's definitely the best part of the movie. I know he keeps saying he's done in interviews, but I just feel like if the MCU comes a-calling, I think he'd say yes. Luckily, they have this big multiverse thing coming up, and I think he's going to come back and get paid to cross over. I think that's eventually what's going to happen. And we'll get we'll get more Tom Tom Hardy Venom. I don't do know how you, they'll bring him back, but they do will. Do you think we will get more Venom with others? I, I definitely think you know. Clearly, they're they're trying to set up something for Noel. Unclear because I don't think they handled it real well in this movie. I think there was a way they could have done that in this movie and set it up for later, much like they did with Thanos. But I think I would have relegated it all to an end credit scene. Like they tried to do, but then take them out of the movie. Like you really make them. I think they make a Kang mistake here, quantum mania style, where you want us to believe that this dude is the, it could be the end of all things. And yet he's a captive the entire movie. And then in the end credit scene, he's free, but we're not even really sure how. And so it's all just weird. And I don't know that anyone leaves the theater thinking, whoo, I need to see some more Noel. <laughs> Unless it's in Marvel Snap. (laughs) Now, I do question, like, since the other symbiotes, like, formed with people that were quote-unquote dying, did they form a codex? And then are we going to find out that Juno got killed? (laughs) And then that's how Noel gets out? These are unimportant details, Cody. Those are only important if you're, you know, like, telling a good story. (laughs) <laughs> which clearly they were not interested in Cody. Who's the loser of the movie? Can I say Michelle Williams? You can say whoever you want. I'm really interested to know how Michelle Williams factors into this. Cause she's not in this movie. I know she's not. Well, she was in the first. Two. I know she was. She was in the second one too. I think so. Oh, okay. I had to go back and watch. What character was she again? She was Eddie's girlfriend fiance uh-huh. went in the first one and then she didn't even get a mention in this one yeah so she's the loser <laughs> she might have actually died in one of these i don't remember <laughs> they've been spaced so far out <laughs> i have it as a tie for the loser of the movie um i'm gonna go with chiwetel edgy of four and Risa fans not only are chiwetel edgy of four and Risa fans both great actors Not only are they both almost completely wasted in this movie and thus overpaid for the cookie cutter roles they were written, but hey, also they're already characters in other parts of the Marvel Universe. Edgy of four played Baron Mordo in the Doctor Strange movies, and if fans is literally another Spider-Man villain, he played Dr. Kurt Connors, AKA the Lizard. It's super weird you would pay these actors what they probably paid them to throw them aimlessly into this movie. That's super weird to me. There are other actors. Why do we, why are we doubling up on actors now? Maybe Sony only has access to these select <laughs> few actors. That's not how the industry <laughs> works. Cody. I'm reason fans is egregious. Like she would tell edgy for I'm like, okay, it's the MCU versus the Sony verse. She would tell or uh, Risa fans was literally in the Sony verse, but maybe not with because they've had multiple Spider-Men. He's actually been in both now because I forget he was in No Way Home as the lizard, not in human form. But yes, ah, so weird, so weird. Um, so that's they're the losers of the movie for me. Because nobody's going to remember they're in it, and they're good enough actors where that should never happen. I honestly forget Michelle Williams is still, like, with us. Because (laughs) she has not been in anything outside of Venom for me. (laughs) I suppose at the end of the day, that's the worst thing you can say about these Venom movies. Is we're going to get 
a couple weeks down the road and you're not going to remember anything from these movies, right? Except uh, for maybe Venom Horse. Venom Horse. <laughs> I will always remember like Mrs. Chin's interactions with Eddie and Venom. But if it is not Tom Hardy, yeah, it's out of my mind. Yeah, this this movie's wild and incredibly forgettable, which leads us to the final rating. Cody, how many Venom horses out of 10 are you giving Venom 3 the last dance? So I'm going to give you a little bit of extra stuff right now. Um, order of Venom movies oh. for like best to worst. Oh, this um, ought to be good. I wouldn't even know how to begin thinking about that. I think Venom 1 is still the best. All right. Um, the Last Dance is second, but it's close to Venom. And then Carnage, or the second one, trash. Shocking Woody Harrelson. Slayer. It is, and I feel bad about that. <laughs> um, how dare you d disparage Matthew McConaughey's long-lost brother? So I'll go on a Venom scale. This is a seven. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Okay. What, what about a real scale? Um, so I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was ever going to be Citizen Kane. So my bar was really low going into it. So like a six and a half. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. Sony, call Cody now. They need to hire you. <laughs> They'll think everything they put out is gold. <laughs> Like, hey, have you seen Morbius, Cody? <laughs> Here, watch Morbius. Tell us how good it is. <laughs> I mean, I also can admit that my expectations were so low. Did I have a good time watching this movie? Sure. It had funny moments. The, the graphics were good. I enjoyed watching the action set pieces. The banter was good between Eddie and Eddie. <laughs> Tom Hardy and Tom Hardy <laughs> as Eddie and Venom. Uh, but it's a four. Um, this is this movie's a solid. So four. I will point out that I'm also going off of Twister and Twisters. Like honestly, storyline and things happening within the story ridiculous in both. But you had fun on the ride, so it has to be above a five. I'm not saying this is Twisters level stuff. Oh, good. Because we were about to throw down. Because I gave Twisters, I think, an eight or an, a nine. I'm uh, a pastor, but I've punched people before. <laughs> Don't test me. <laughs> but, like, I can't say, like, if I had fun during the movie, because that's at the end of the day, did, did you have fun? Did you enjoy it? Did it bring about some sort of emotion? It did. So it had to be above a five for me. Okay. That's reasonable. And I can say that, yes, it doesn't. It, nobody at Sony was putting this movie out there as Shawshank Redemption. Nope. It's not supposed to be deep. It's supposed to be just a fun time at the movies. And you know what? It was fine. And it wasn't Joker, too. It was fine. There was a family with like eight children under the age of 10 behind us in this movie. We saw this at the same time. We did. But that only mildly distracted me. I will say there was a lot of people there for our theater. Yeah. On a Tuesday night. Yeah, there was. There was. So, all right. Yeah. What are you? Have you guys seen Venom 3, The Last Dance? I hope so, because we just spoiled the nerd out of it. And that will affect your enjoyment. No, it won't. You'll enjoy the movie just fine. Yep. Being spoiled. Uh, how did you like it? Tell us what you think about our opinions. Uh, on all these things, who was your favorite parts? What was your least favorite parts? Who's the winner of the movie? Who's the loser of the movie? Tell us all that on social media, on the posts for this episode. Also, can I please, can I plead, can I beg you, if it's not too undignifying, please subscribe to the pod if you haven't already. And please help us out by like sharing our posts about the episodes, share those with your timelines. We'd really like to get more people listening to the pod so we can make the community bigger. Um, it's just really important to us. We, we want to make our community bigger so we can come together on the things we like, the things we have in common, which is geek culture. We love geek culture. We go to comic cons and like mixing it up with the folks there. So help us out. We will see you next time.